So, so thank you so much for giving me the opportunity today. And uh, as Daria said, it's a completely different story from the one that she's just shared. The title of my talk is Rediscovering Connection Through Interoception. But truthfully, the subtitle is more important. It's a dad and lad's journey to understand profound interoceptive dysregulation. So to give you a little bit of a, a background as to the story that Daria shared, uh, for many years I've been building a career in tech sales, leading teams, uh, building regions, and working for some of the fastest growing technology companies. And um, while outwardly it looked successful and had all the trappings of a successful career, to be frank, back at home I was failing. I wasn't doing terribly well with the other side of my uh, life balance. I got two great sons, and my youngest fellow, however, who's 15, Will, is autistic. And while I was running around the world leading teams, this young man was really profoundly struggling with the, uh, the emotional dysregulation that we, uh, we saw growing in him over the, over the years. Uh, we had a lot of challenges at home. We had a great many challenges for him in school. He was suspended two, two terms in a row, five times. Um, every week, my wife or I would be called into the school to deal with and emotional and often violent outbursts, and uh, we were really challenged. So while I was running around trying to lead everywhere, um, I really forgot to lead and to be able to manage the person who was closest to my heart. And then suddenly, in the way that the universe works, I had a rug pulled from under me. And back in uh, the start of 24, I was made redundant from all those jobs that Daria just reminded me about. Um, and I suddenly had this wonderful opportunity for the first time uh, since we had Will, to actually stop and pause and wait and listen to this young man and try to understand him in a way that I hadn't been able to up to that point and really spend time focusing on helping this young guy become the person that I really desperately hoped he could. See, we'd been on a fairly long path up to that point. Um, we had a diagnosis for Will back when he was about seven, eight years of age and uh, we'd been to psychiatrists, psychologists, behavioural therapists, you know, the uh, amount of people that you can run around to. And we'd never really got to the root of what this emotional explosiveness actually was, uh, was being caused by. We were very aware that in ASD, in children with autism and neurodivergent children, uh, oftentimes they can get into a fight, flight or freeze um, response to a strong external stimuli. The amygdala kicks in and effectively shuts down that frontal cortex where the executive function is. They just can't think. They're in a hyper-reactive mode and no matter how many uh, times you turn on the lights or you uh, put the ear defenders on, you can't always get those uh, hyper-reactive states under control. And the only other option that we were being faced with was to medicate him and to subdue him. And we actually tried at one point and my wife and I immediately rejected it because this really wasn't a path we wanted to take, which was dimming the light of this great young kid in order to really mask something that we couldn't properly understand at the root. So, we, we really were on a journey to try to understand how we could help him. And uh, more at a habit than necessarily at a hope, I attended a presentation at a local mental health clinic uh, about uh, neurodivergence and, uh, and kids and teens. And I sat through the first number of sessions and I thought as I do, I'm sure I know all this, I've heard all this before. They talked about uh, particularly that kind of sensory overwhelm and the way that that can lead to emotional outbursts. But at the very end of the presentation, a young occupational therapist from South Africa got up and she started to talk about the eight senses. And immediately I went, no, 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 there's only seven. But she talked for the first time I'd ever come across this word called interoception. She described interoception as the ability for us to be able to sense our internal body's functions. Uh, when, you ha when you're hungry, when maybe you're uh, getting out of breath, when, you're, uh, when you get that tingling feeling in the, ba in the back of your neck. And I sat there and thought to myself, is there a connection between this interoception and the potential for like a, a, an emotional thing, a gut feeling? You know, those sort of butterflies that you get, that sort of flipping when you're nervous. And I put my hand up and asked her and she said, yep, it was. So I went home and I was literally buzzing at this stage um, and just thinking to myself, I think I might have grabbed the end of what would be Will's red thread. And I use that word to describe it because really it was a, a, very a very slim understanding of something that intuitively I felt was important. So I decided to pull on it as hard as I could because I'm just that kind of guy. When I went home, I started to research and much more deeply understand the word interoception and, and the research that had been done over the last number of years. It's only a fairly recently understood sense 
One of the pioneers uh, in, uh, in studying it was a gentleman by the name of Professor Antonio de Tomasio. And um, he talked about these things called somatic markers. In effect, what happens is when, an, when a, uh, an experience occurs to us, when something happens like an angry dog starts barking, we actually go through a physiological change before our brain is aware of it. We start to, our heart starts to race or our skin starts to tingle or your muscles tense up. And it's only after you've experienced the physiological change that your mind then becomes aware through interoception that that state is adjusted and then it starts to think about what it needs to do next. So that physiology shift occurs before the emotion of fear or anxiety or, or the, the tension of being barked at by a, a very small and uh, angry dog uh, might express. I started to speak to a couple of the researchers in the field and had the opportunity, because I had the time, to engage with a couple of the, uh, the researchers in different universities around the world. And the one that really struck me was I had a, uh, had a conversation with Dr. Helen Wang, who's a researcher in the University of California. And something that she left me with was terribly profound. That was that emotions, she said to me, that emotions by their very nature are embodied. In effect, the most deeply, deeply felt emotions that we feel are actually physical in, in their foundation. And it's only through this back and forth dialogue between the body and the mind that we can actually experience any emotional change like happiness or sadness or anxiety or, uh, or excitement. And this for me really started to get my brain worrying about what it might mean for Will. I sat down and I started then to look at how we had, um, how, how this, this kid had grown up. He was born premature, uh, about four or five weeks premature. He was also born with a tongue tie. He was born also with a, um, uh, he was born with very bad reflux, at a, a, a hernia. But most importantly too, he was born with a tooth on the bottom gum. And up until the time when we could get it removed at the age of six weeks old, it used to cut the underside of his tongue. And every time this little man was hungry, every time he was crying for food, he'd get pain when suddenly he was fed. So that deep primal instinct to be fed or to be comforted or to, to be nurtured was being met with an immediate trigger of pain. And I thought, what if this kid's wiring has actually almost been fried? He's become conditioned to look at those sensations that were coming from his gut, hunger, or maybe anxiety, maybe um, uh, frustration, and he was actually recognizing them as danger signals, and he was triggering his amygdala and going straight into a, for Will, a fight, fight, or fight mode. So I started to, to make these connections. And one of the ways that I sat down and I chatted with my wife about it, uh, I tried to explain it in this way. I said, can you imagine that you wake up one morning and it's, uh, you're barefoot in a totally pitch dark room, and you stand up and you start to walk. You stand on something and it's pain. You turn around, you stand on something else, and it's even more painful. You turn around and you bang into something, and over and over again, this pain from a source that you don't know just keeps coming at you. Pretty soon, you're going to get to a point where you're going to feel pretty helpless. You're going to feel pretty hopeless. You'll feel a sense of despair, and just, you won't even bother moving around the room. But what if somebody walks into that room and just flicks on a light switch, and suddenly you realize that actually, there's pieces of Lego and upturned plugs and coffee tables that you've been kicking your relationship with that environment is entirely shifted. It doesn't mean that the Lego pieces disappear, but now it means that you know that they're there and you can navigate them in a way that's meaningful. And for us, once we became aware of interoception, that's what that, that felt like for us. It literally felt like a light switch. So the next day, I sat Will down, my wife and I chatted to him, and we said, hey, we're going to talk to you a little bit about interoception and we're going to talk about your feeding issues and we're going to talk about the emotional volatility that creates all that aggressive behavior that we've seen for the last 14 years. And we talked it through and it got really, really quiet. Probably the first time in maybe 14 years. Really reflective. And he looked at me and he said, Dad, I think you got it. And from that moment, quite genuinely, I hope I'm not too emotional, our whole life shifted. We'd lived with a dark cloud over us for 14 years. The last six years particularly were marked with violence and with uh, a great deal of emotional volatility. The next day I took him out for an ice cream, take a little uh, a walk and uh, chatted to him and I asked him to reflect on what we had discussed the day before. And he said, yeah, I think you got it. And he said, you know something funny, Dad? When I was thinking about it, I, I realised that I never knew what people meant by a gut feeling. 
And it really just, uh, it, it almost hurt me inside to think this really clever, this really uh, uh, bright young person was going around and really was being uh, encumbered by things he couldn't understand, he didn't even know to name. So we started to work together on mindfulness. We started to work together on breathing, grounding him, allowing him to take a little bit of a beat and make sure that he recognized the types of changes that were happening in his body. And he went from a place where he couldn't sit in the classroom from one end of the day to the other, to today he's just on his fourth junior cert exam. Um, he's, uh, he's rocking it. He, uh, and he's looking forward to uh, completing them over the next week. So please, everybody keep your fingers crossed that he continues on. Um, but I do want to also just quickly add that it was an unusual journey for me because I actually leaned very heavily onto generative AI to be able to look at all the information that I had. I looked at uh, neonatal uh, neurology, uh, psychiatry, uh, behavioral therapy, uh, somatic therapy. And I was able to turn them around by using ChatGPT and AI LLMs until I was able to see this red thread that was Will. And it, when we pulled it, it worked. But I also got this very profound little wallop as well about AI. We're all sitting in a world where AI is dominating. But actually, it's a wonderful thing to have, a, to have uh, understood interoception. Uh, interoception is only a human condition. You have to have a body to be able to, to provide that emotional route. So no matter how good the algorithm gets or how many chips NVIDIA cell, uh, cells, we're, uh, we're okay. <coughs> Um, so look, I'm going to leave you with this. I do have a genuine hope that maybe this new word for me is a new word for you, and that it can provoke a conversation about how your emotions uh, are rooted. Maybe you can take a breath, take a beat, take a drink of water, and find yourself in a place where you're able to get to a, a much more responsive way of treating the world, not reacting just because your body's told you to. The other thing I very, very much hope for is that at some point in the future, we will start to talk about proactive interoceptive training for young people who have had feeding issues or have had some uh, birth trauma to be able to help their parents effectively avoid the challenge that we had. I put together a short primer. If anybody wants to scan that, they can take it. And um, it talks a little bit about interoceptive dysregulation for neurodiverse parents. Or please reach out to me. I'd be delighted to talk about it. So thank you very much. Thank you.